I went to my boss and I went, I can't see the wood for the trees here. How do I even tackle this? And he turned around and he says, James, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. My name's Peter Sumpton, and this is the Marketing Study Lab podcast. A podcast for those that are thinking, have thought and are doing, or already have a marketing qualification. But there's a little bit of something for everyone, as we cover a whole host of marketing topics. I chat to some amazing guests, each one a superstar in their own niche. And if you have a burning marketing question already, or after this episode, get in touch. We'll chat it through. Peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk or find me on LinkedIn. The link is in the show notes. If you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, this will really help others find this podcast and spread the marketing word. Now let's get on with today's episode. marketers learn from accountancy? Well, it turns out quite a lot when it comes to assignments and exams. And we're not talking numbers and figures here. We're talking straight up valuable tips. First of all, we actually need an accountant we can talk to about this. And fortunately enough, we've got one amazing ex, I suppose, accountant with us today. Welcome, Mr. James Perry. James has traversed from being an accountant, a top accountant at that, to an accountancy exam coach. James is spreading his words of wisdom over podcasts, videos, coaching, and public speaking, while also speaking in schools about emotional well-being and entrepreneurship, which is just an amazing thing to do. But what me and James will be chatting about today are the missing elements of passing an assignment or an exam, those parts that can easily be forgotten. And they're applicable to so many different professions, especially accountancy and marketing, which is fortunate for everybody listening, really. So let's put down our pens and calculators for now and ask James, for full disclosure purposes, of course, have you ever cheated on anything? Oh, Peter, what a question to (laughs) to ask. I'm going to officially say no on that one. I am going to practice what I preach. I'm sorry, I have, no, I have absolutely no stories about cheating. Um, not in a, a test sense, anyway. Great. <laughs> Neither do I, so... Uh, I will leave that one up to the imagination. <laughs> yeah, okay, moving on. Very, very quickly. Uh, right, James, what's brought you to this stage in your career as an accounting exam coach? Oh, Peter, um, it's been a, my accounting journey. So how I became an accountant was the very much the stereotypical one. So I done a level accountancy. I then went and done a degree in accounting, a master's in advanced accounting, and then became a chartered accountant in 2006. And to be honest, Peter, that's where, if you ask me the question, why you want to be an accountant? It was the, the, the answer everybody normally gives, lots of money. Mm-hmm. Now that stereotype might or may not be true, and that's maybe another question for another time. but. The, the lure of having a, pro, a secure job and that sort of, you will have a professional qualification was something that was very truly was dear to me in a way because none of the family even had went to, to university. So that was at that point I got fully qualified. The exam coaching piece simply was me waking up um, in the middle of the night, approximately two and a half years ago, going, I helped someone through an exam about five years ago. I think it was one of the trainees whenever I was a senior manager at Grant Thornton. I helped them through an exam. Goodness, I could do this as a business. Hmm. That's how it started. Literally, I woke up in the middle of the night. That's usually how the best business starts, waking Hmm. up in the middle of the night and thinking, why haven't I been doing this forever? So this good old subconscious mind was obviously working on this idea, and I had no, no notion of it. That, that's cool. So anybody that's watching or listening, just go to sleep and then whatever you think of while you're asleep, 
Sleep is incredibly underrated, by the way, and it's a, yeah. it's a, tip, it's a tip that I, or it's something that I stress in my, in my students, and you know, is that you need to get your rest mm. because the mind body connection is so strong that if you are running on half empty, you're not going to do yourself justice in any exam. So get that rest in as well. So yep. definitely. And if you're properly planning as well, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a standard, it's an absolute given. Why wouldn't you plan in when you're going to have rest? And that's, that's one thing we might chat about a little bit later, but it's, like, it's as important as your, your studies to, to, get, to get that kind of rest because yeah. it just resets the, the, the brain. And you know, people say the brain's like a sponge and it soaks things up. Well, that's great, but it can only absorb so much at, at, at one time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think Peter, this is where I termed exam coach rather than lecturer or tutor, because I think I was too narrow, fo- narrow of a focus. You know, students come to me and expect that I'm going to go through tactical material, mm-hmm. and then I, the way I'm not, but I'm going to coach you through the process, which to me is a more holistic thing. So therefore, diet and sleep and all those other things are equally as important in my in my opinion. Yeah, so, sure. So. What, what the main reason that I wanted to get you on today is that in, in chatting before we were recording this, it was blatantly obvious that through your accountancy coaching and my uh, tutoring, because I, I, I do do a bit of the, the old, uh, you need the practical and the theory and, and, and then apply it within the marketing assignments and qualifications. It's because when, when we've been chatting previously, there's so many synergies between what we both do, what we practice, what we preach, and what we tell people, that I've got a long, long list. I don't know how far we'll get through today, but a long, long list of things that apply to both concepts in accountancy, in marketing, and probably any exam. What I was, Peter, I was actually, I went through a rebranding there a number of months ago, and I was toying with the idea of calling myself professional exam coach because there are so many similarities now. I've chose not to and to stay within my market because if there's something comes left field and someone has a bit of a technical accounting problem, I can't help with that. That's, mm-hmm. that's fine. But certainly the, the, the broad principles of all this, Peter, it's so, it's like universal essentially. And it applies to so many things. Definitely. Yeah. So the first, the first point I want to cover um, is when people get an assignment or they sit down in an exam, they've, they've learned a lot and they've, they've you know, they've, crammed for want of a better word enough as much as they possibly can they feel ready and then they get into the exam or they're reading an assignment and they read a question and they think i know what i'll write for this and they end up writing their own not what the question's asking so from an accountancy point of view how easy is it is it to do that to see a question and think yeah i'm going to write what i feel rather than what it's asking yeah so i done a video tip on this probably about two years ago and it simply is, it's four words, or sorry, it's literally I just stand there and go, read the bloody question. <laughs> That's all I do and I stand there, right? I was going to make it more flurry in my language, but I didn't. I just, that was what I, but it very much is that. So essentially what, what people do, and I've seen this time and time again, Peter, they go, hello, examiner. I have learned all this stuff and I've sacrificed my life for three months. Here we go. Let's regurgitate everything I've learned. And as you quite rightly say, they will answer the question they want to answer, not the question that's been asked of them. That's a hugely common problem Yeah. Um, for that simple fact. And it's an emotional response. And this is where I get into the mindset piece. This is an emotional response where they're going, right, I've suffered for these months. Here we go. And Essentially, Peter, it's very, very, I think it's an easy thing to solve. And if you have, uh, it's a process that I, that I explain to my students on how to read a question. You know, you have the time management now, and we can talk about, in a minute, we can talk about what I believe the structure of, of answering a full question. As mm-hmm. people see. But once you've read, read the blurb or that part of the, the question, first of all, you read the requirement, obviously. You read the blurb. But then you go and what I tell my students is you put it, put together a five or six bullet point plan of what you're going to do. You've brainstormed the question. You've highlighted the keywords. You've written your thoughts down in the margins. Then go down and just bullet point those five or six 
um, key headings that you think need to put a bit of structure, and you'd be amazed how well that answer will come out. Yeah, and you imagine if you're writing a book or writing anything or doing anything that feels like it's a mountain to climb, and when you you start on on a course or for a qualification, regardless of what it is, it is a mountain to climb, and you feel like you don't know anything, and then you get into this exam or you look at this assignment, and like you said, it's so easy to to think I'm just gonna it, it just comes out because you, you don't want to forget anything and you want people to know you know it everything. And it's like, well, that isn't that isn't the way it should work. You need to apply what you've learned in various pockets. And if you go back to writing a book, it's like nobody starts with the intro. Well, they could do, but they'd be very lucky to start with an intro and then go through it bit by bit by bit and come out in the end. No, no, no. You'll start with various touch points in that book that you need to cover or that's going to make it an interesting book, say a, a, a thriller or a murder mystery. You know, you're not going to start writing it by not knowing who's done it <laughs> in the end. I think you're 100% right with that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll tie it down back into the study. Yeah. So I worked as a senior audit manager in Grant Thornton. Um, I then moved into industry, became a financial controller. And my first role in the industry was to take on a half a billion turnover business. That okay. was a it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a great move because of, of the experience I gained. But it was a crazy move now you look back on it. And I was doing my first ever VAT return. Never done a VAT return before for a quarter of a million, or sorry, a quarter of a billion turnover business. I went to my boss and I went, I can't see the wood for the trees here. How do I even tackle this? And he turned around and he says, James, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. It has to be bite. It has to be bite-sized chunks. Yeah, I love it. It's exactly the same as study, and we'll talk about study technique in a second maybe, but it's exactly the same you're talking about. Your approach to writing the book, your approach to answering that question, it has to be in bite-sized chunks. But then the trick on that is you've written your bite-sized chunks, but you also have to be conscious of linking them small chunks together to make it a coherent answer. Yeah. That's where, but you're definitely right. Take it step by step, and don't get overawed by this massive task ahead of you if you be logical and break it down it certainly makes it much easier i think that brings me on to uh, the next point and the reason that I'm, I'm bringing it up is is because i was talking to a student the other day and and they've done exactly this and it's so easy to fall foul to it particularly marketing it'll be interesting to see if it's from an accountancy point of view as well but i'm reading an assignment and two or three times they've mentioned some kind of theory or model but they just literally mentioned it and okay. the first part the first time they mentioned it i said that just looks like a theory dump to me. You haven't added any value to it. The second time we got to the, the sentence and I said, now read that sentence. What have you done there? And they just said, theory dump. And it's just so easy to do because again, you feel like you need to impact it, get, get it out of your system. I know all these models, I'm going to write them down because I'll get marks for them. You won't because you're not applying it. Yeah, the, there's a couple of things I would say in that one. Number one is the number of questions or requirements that ask you to identify and explain something. People are great at identifying, they're awful at explaining something. Mm -hmm. you always, so you're losing marks hand over fist. The other thing that I see all the time, Peter, is that, especially in conclusions, whenever you're concluding on a point, they seem to rewrite the point again. <laughs> you're only going to get the marks once. Yeah. You know, and I see that time and time and time again. But um, no, definitely the, oh, the, the conclusion is very, very important, but also being concise and coherent is equally as important but getting the facts down and explaining it briefly and concisely and not waffle i mm -hmm. don't know what i don't know what you what you see in in marketing in terms of people waffling about the theory writing just regurgitating something that's not relevant happens all the time in accounting yeah yeah same same in marketing it's it, it, it it's particularly in the assignment because you're not in a room for a select certain number of hours writing until your hand bleeds yeah, but yeah you've got time on your hands and it's just really easy to almost copy and paste theory but then try and make it your own and in doing that you think well there's loads of theory been written here in, in one textbook against another combine it all together and then you just have one long ream of of, of just not nonsense but like you say you're only going to get that mark once you're not going to get four five six seven it's one mark so write for that one mark and also, it's quality over quantity. Yeah. Everything. 
you know, a well-structured five sentences is better than 15 sentences of absolute dribble and, and waffle. Yeah. So you know? in, in accountancy, I'm guessing the questions are, uh, are weighted in terms of marks. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what usually happens, and it, it's amazing, you almost see people's eyes light up when you tell them this, in that break the question down. Break it down, look at the marks, how much, how your word count or your page count and work out how much you should be writing for it. Yeah, yeah. I would certainly say, so if you have a 10 mark, 10 mark question, um, I would normally say to my accounting students, right, you're typically, if you want to pass, now this is, if you want to pass the paper and just get it done, you're typically looking for about seven to eight strong points, so those 10 marks. Invariably, you're going to get roughly one and a half marks per strong point to a maximum. Then there'll be a cap on it. But if you want to cover yourself and make sure you're going to pass this paper, that's the way you need to think of. You need to think about the 70% or the 80%, the good old Pareto principle. <laughs> you know the 80-20 rule? Yeah. It applies in everything in life. Think of it like that. I think your yeah. marks of that as well. That's I need genius. to get 80% of that. So something that I, I try and practice um, throughout everything, particularly in, in, in work life, is the, and it goes back to an 80-20 rule, but it's when you work, actually working on something. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it was it was Dan Sullivan um, who like wrote about this, and it, it's basically an 80-20 kind of rule. And what he was saying is that if you try and get something to 100% complete yourself, it is you get it to 80%, it's so difficult to get that extra 20%. And yeah. if you think how much that 20% stands for, it's pointless. So yeah. do your 80%, pass it off to somebody else who can do another 80% of that 20% that's left. And that gets it to, uh, my maths is shocking, so I, don't, I shouldn't be talking like this to somebody that's into accountancy, but you know, you, you get in there slowly and slowly. And, and if you think about, you pass it off to the third person, well, they're working on about, six or seven percent that they need to get it to to a hundred percent and it's the other thing the other thing and i see peter and this is a specific example for accounting but the, the principle applies and it also takes into account time management is that there is a statement in accounting called the statement of financial position it used to be called the balance sheet mm -hmm. where the top half of the balance sheet has to equal the bottom half of your balance sheet assets less liabilities equals your capital fine and if you're typically given a question on that, every student will say the say the the question takes thirty minutes to complete. You will bet your bottom dollar more than fifty percent after forty five or fifty minutes are still trying to get their balance sheet to balance, right? And the reason why they're doing that, they're only going after two marks mm -hmm. because they've already got credit for so much more in that question. And what are they foregoing? They're foregoing the 5, 10, 15 marks of wasted time that they could be getting in another question. Not just that, but the easy marks as well. Oh, completely. So it's the 80-20 rule, even with that. If you think, believe you've got the 80% and you're stuck for time, you move on to the next question. And I've got a time management technique that you can't come back and, and add more value and look and refer, review things. But certainly 80-20 rule in every aspect of life is so key. Yeah. Com completely agree. So, in 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 marketing, they they essentially uh, I try and drill it into students that you need sort of three things. So, it's always done. Assignments are always done from an organisation's point of view. So you choose an organisation yourself, and it's yep. usually the one you work for because you know the most about it. And plus, you can apply it afterwards. Yep. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the theory and the research, the concepts and everything else. The third and final thing, and this is the, the, the part that in marketing a lot of students forget, is the real life examples uh, to back up your theory or back up any statements, particularly, I, I'm, I'm constantly using the word justification when I speak to people. And yep. it's re these real life examples that can justify your answer. Is that the same in accountancy? Yeah, yeah. So it'll, the exams are whatever it will be in a fictitious scenario. Yeah. So you'll have your fictitious company in the body of the question. And this is a key thing that I tell my students that are, that are going from foundational exams to professional exams. Professional exams are called professional for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's teaching you to become professional. 
and people tend to forget that. So what I, I, what I, how I encompass that would use the word advisor. You are going to become a trusted advisor, and that's what these professional exams are going to do. So you're quite right in your approach. You give an introduction, you give an argument, you talk about your theory, you talk about your application, but then you have to actually specifically um, address it to the body of the question, to the company, to the board of directors, to the personalities involved. What's the geographical location? What's the name of the product? You're quite right. You have to, that's the next step to become an advisor. Because whenever you're in work, you're not just going to be, going to be writing pages and pages of theory. You have to actually, uh, you're going to answer problems. You're a problem solver for your client. So therefore, it applies just as much in terms of accounting. Um, okay. Definitely right. You have to address the, per the people involved. Yeah, that, that, that's good to know. So when the, the, they're in an exam, uh, like any exam, it's only it's only for, for a particular time period or a particular page or word count. And I've seen assignment papers and exam papers that might be worth three or four marks and going back to the original, check the weighting on each and, and write for that. Um, but it, it, it baffles me sometimes when you see answers and they'll be twice as long as they need to be. Um, what, how, how, can you, how can we advise people to, to check the word count or stick to the page count? Well, in terms of accounting exams, um, and I can see going back to the waffle point where they just continue to waffle, is that their time management generally is very, very poor. Yeah. So I would tend to, on the accounting exam point of view, uh, is then I'd go, you're writing reams and reams and reams of nonsense. There's something up with your time management because those, again, those, those questions are weighted for a reason in that mm -hmm. manner. They're directing you that this answer should only have to take a certain amount of words or a certain amount of time to complete. So if you have to do um, a 1500 word assignment um, for marketing, go and ask that person or go and ask your tutor, how long do you think this should take? And then tweak your approach accordingly. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a massive problem I see in any exam, Peter, is, mm -hmm. is people taking up so much time and so much effort as well. Remember, you, you've got mental energy there that's being wasted in the middle of an exam. It's, pre it's, very, it's precious. Yeah. It, just to sit back and monitor your time. It certainly worked. That worked for me, actually. I yeah. Bit of a waffler. I remember when I was doing my, my exams and the very first thing I do is get in, work out what the time was, to work out when it finishes and when I need to be at each question. And I suppose a, a little tip that, that I got from, from exams more than assignments, because you know time isn't a massive problem with assignments, is that when you're writing, if the time finishes for that question that you've marked down at the start, go on to the next one. Yeah. Because like we were talking about, it's easy marks at the start. You pick up easy marks because it's the complex parts that are difficult to get the marks for. But if you're starting a question, then you're gonna get a couple of marks straight off the bat. So leave a space when you finish or, or the time finishes on a particular question. So you can go back to it at the end if you get that time. Don't yeah. give up the easy marks. Yeah, I've got a quite, so I've developed my own time management process that I tell my, uh, my clients. Now, this is a principle rather than a rule. Um, so therefore, my clients can tweak this in certain ways. So a typical, a typical accounting exam is, say for argument's sake, it's three hours long, 180 minutes. Most students will break that down to 1.8 minutes per mark. Right? I tell students to take one hour off that and to break it down to 1.2 minutes per mark. That ensures two things. Number one, you're going to finish the paper, which is a massive issue. Most people don't get to the last question in the accountancy exam. And number two, you won't waffle. You won't regurgitate or keep on going and going. It makes you more succinct. So why did I take one hour off? Well, the one hour that I have just saved you, you split into two 30 minutes. The first 30 minutes is going to give you additional reading, brainstorming, and planning time, which is absolutely critical. And then the final 30 minutes is what I call the 30 minutes for anything else. If you need to go to the loo, if you honestly if you have a mental breakdown in the middle of the exam where you need to just refocus close your eyes take a few breaths and get back to it mm. 
or where you need, we can go back to those questions and add a lot more value. That 30 minute buffer. And now that, that 1.2 minutes of mark could be 1.5 for some people. That's where people need to road test this idea whenever they're doing past papers and mock papers. And that has changed people for me by giving, yep. them, giving them that principle. That's cool. That's genius. I, I love I love anything like that. Anything where you, you, you're categorizing things, making sure you've got the time, you're applying it correctly, and plus you give yourself that additional backstop. Because yeah. like you say, you could you could be going great guns and then you get to a question and it just all falls apart. You're like, I haven't got a clue how to answer this. But it's like, no, no, you do. It's just, it's just hit you straight away. So just take that time. Exams, Peter, should be a very logical process. And me, as, a, as an accountant, I am sort of built on logic. <laughs> um, you know, the, the sort of spreadsheet that's in my mind. Uh, this is how things happen and co- compartmentalization and things. Yeah. But like I say to many people, see once emotions come in, logic goes away. It clears off out the window mm-hmm. and it disappears and it abandons you. So that's the reason why I'm saying to, if you need to, in the middle of any exam, you need to close your eyes, count your breaths for 30 seconds and refocus to let logic come back in and, you know, do that bit more planning or whatever. That's what you need to do. Yeah. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very emotional thing. Exams. So before, before the exam, when people are doing the research, it, and this is still quite prevalent in, in marketing, it does, my, it does my head in a bit. You, the, the obvious one is, is ask Google. And I always, I always, when I don't know a question, I'm open and honest about it. And I'll say, I'm just going to ask Google, so why don't you do it? Uh, but the thing that's more prevalent in marketing is that you start this process and you'll get a book about that thick. And that is just so off-putting because you just see it and you think, I'm going to have to read that and learn and understand every single part of that book to pass this assignment. It's like, no, you're not. You're not. You're just not. Different parts of it you'll need. I'm I'm guessing it's the same thing in the accountancy, but the the point that I suppose I'm trying to raise is that it doesn't just have to be through a book that you're going to learn. Good old daily 20 again. You don't need to know 100% of the book. You need to know up to 80% of it. And I said intentionally up to 80% because, you know, like I say to all my, I'll give an example, a very quick example. Chartered Accountants Ireland, I came joint 11th in Ireland in my final exams, right? Because they only marked the top 10. Everyone else came joint 11th as well. Okay? So if you want to get placed or if you want perfection at 100%, by all means, learn every single word in that textbook. But if you want to pass these exams and get credible qualifications, you have no need to do that. And you're quite right. <laughs> People will ask me questions and it's exactly the same response. Peter, go and ask Google. Yeah. Um, it's conditioning. And I think it's conditioning way back in our early school days mm-hmm. where we believe all knowledge is in a book. No, there's knowledge everywhere. Also, you have no need to ask Mr. Google, but you can't go and ask your peers. The best way of learning, I think it's a scientifically proven, the best way of learning actually is by teaching someone else. Mm-hmm. So you go to your mate who you're doing your exam with, you teach them one bit of information and in return, they'll teach you something else. So it's a math, and your community that you're building, is what I see is fantastic for that, and people commenting and sharing thoughts and sharing ideas. Um, that's the way to learn. And that's also the way to get practical application. Mm. Sometimes books don't have enough practical application. Yeah. Are more scary, go and talk to people. That is definitely the way to go forward. And by all means, use it. good old coaches as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, I suppose we should really plug that part now, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I suppose fi- final point that, that I wanted to make is that before you do any of your studies, and I'm amazed how many people don't do this, it's just like a, a, a no-brainer to me. And, and, and that is before you do your studies, you know the end date, either an exam or an assignment submission. Yeah. Why aren't you creating a timeline for when you need to do these things? Uh-huh. I mean, I suppose particularly in accountancy, it, 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 being in that structured way, it should help. But it's the same for marketing. It needs to be structured. Set yourself those deadlines. You would say, you would think, Peter, that because good old, stu- or good old accountancy students and whatever, they've got this DNA of let's structure this. Let's plan this. Let's be OCD about this. 
let's get a spreadsheet together and do a study plan. I would say 80% of my students do not do a study plan. Yeah. It's the most unusual thing. It's something you think that accountants would be to pride themselves on. We don't checklist and we don't do it. So what I call it, Peter, is it's a study on life plan. I call, I, I call it both things because if someone contacts me typically three months before their exam and I'm going, okay, I want to see draft one of a study and life plan before we talk again. And they look at me and I go, well, you have to have life in this as well. You know, life and the holistic approach that we've just mentioned is equally as important as a study. Because I don't know how, what, what, where you see this, Peter, is that people get mixed up between the concept of study and of quality study. I think it's a very different thing. So people will sit at this massive textbook with a glazed look in their eyes and believe they're studying and they're doing nothing about it. Whereas if you do these pockets of productivity that I tell people, focus 90 minute sessions, smaller sessions, get a timetable out, boom, I'm going to do this task, boom, boom, boom. You can't go out on a Friday night with your mates. You can't go to the gym. You can't go to the cinema. As long as you've got it detailed and you stick to the plan. Yeah. That is a, that's, a deal, that's a game changer. C- completely agree. And- I think a, a good analogy that I use is that if you look at uh, a game of sport, for example, you've got two great teams pitting against each other. It's very rare, if impossible, for one of those two teams to be going at 100 miles an hour for the whole time of that, that game or whatever it is. It's just not going to happen. They pick and choose their moments yeah. to be excellent and exceptional or go for the jugular. And, it, and it's a similar thing. It's like, you don't have to be cramming for hours and hours and hours. Pick your times. It might be you're, you're an early bird and, and you love getting up early and you're really focused in the morning. Then then do it then. And and then forget about it in, in the afternoon where you might be a bit more lethargic because you were up early. You might you might study at night because you just you don't like going to bed. <laughs> you just don't. And and if that's the case, then use that time wisely and, and do it then. You know, you can get very creative with it. That if you have got one hour for your lunch, there's nothing to say you can't do 45 minutes in your lunch break. Yeah. Get that knocked out. Um, also, another one is why not? This is a bit of a crazy one, and people think I am crazy, but I do it. You know, a lot of people have got Audible in the car. So why don't you go into YouTube and download, convert it to YouTube to MP3, a lecture or something that's on a topic that you need to study? Put it on your phone, listen to it in the car. Yeah. That's active study. Whenever you are in the gym, do the same. Put it in your phone, put it in your earphones, listen to it while you go for a walk. There are so many ways that you can get this done. Yep. I mean, um, I suppose we should say at this point, podcasts are quite good for things like that as well. Of course. Of course. With all these study tips and it's your <laughs> podcast and accounting exam coach podcast as well. But it's very, people are, are again, Oh, I've mentioned it again and again, conditioning. It's people have been taught through school or parental influence or whatever that you have to read a book and you have to do it at seven, eight o'clock at night. You don't have to, know. Yeah, you completely know. agree. Way, ways and means around it now. Uh, final thing, just while it's it's on my brain, is that especially for, for people that, it, it, when people go to university and then they go to study a professional marketing qualification it can be a gift and a curse because the assignments and the exam shouldn't be written in an academic way um to to pass a a cim qualification but my point that i'm leading on to is that although it's not an academic way of writing you still have to reference correctly and is that the same with accountancy referencing is massively important accountancy isn't hugely theoretical and you're referencing in terms of having a bibliography at the back. We're not really like that, especially in the exams, it's not like that. But there are things called accounting standards and auditing standards, and you've got tax legislation, and you've got company law, and you have a raft of things, and you've got you know corporate governance codes, and you've all these other things. Um, you don't, in an exam, because accountancy is more exam-based than, than assignment-based, it, it's, it's getting those words in there. So, we were talking about, you were saying about a theory dump. To a certain extent, you need to do that in accounting, but then back it up with the application. So you need to say that IFRS 12 
says X, Y, Z. This is the problem it's going to solve. This is what's applied. And then this is how, it, how it's going to solve your problem in real life. So it's not your Harvard referencing or anything like that, but you do have to mention that stuff time mm -hmm. and time again. Because the examiner is looking at that. They're looking for those key words that they're going to give credit to. Yeah. So yeah, you need to mention those, definitely. Absolutely. So on Marketing Study Lab, what we, what we like to do is near the end is ask our guest some quick fire questions okay. just you know a bit bit quicker than than the ones we've been going through not that we've been talking about questions mainly but more like points than hints and tips there's only a few but i know you'll you'll be fine with these oh, are you good I? <laughs> so the first one is name one must read business book i am going to be controversial and this isn't just purely business i think everybody should be reading this for personal development and business development it's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It's the number one classic self-development book. And if you do the principles in that, you will grow personally and in business. What was the last thing you Googled? Oh, God. Um, what was the Champions League draw? <laughs> That's probably mine as well. <laughs> I was quite glad to see who Liverpool got. Yeah, same here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what is your most used app at the moment? Most used app is LinkedIn. Um, I've spent a bit of time developing LinkedIn over the last number of years. Mm -hmm. I actually then went off LinkedIn a bit because of maybe trends I was seeing in the content. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, last year I maybe slipped off the ball with accounting exam coach because I was doing another business as well. But I'm right back into focus with accounting exam coach and LinkedIn. It's where a lot of students will be. It's a lot of clients will be a lot of young professionals, unestablished professionals. And I, I tell you what, again, another platform that you can potentially learn off or at least find those people you should be learning off LinkedIn. Fantastic. Um, what would be your one tip for people that are studying at the moment? If you, if you had to give them one piece of advice. Apart from hiring a mentor. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, no, no, no. Let's stick with that. Why should okay. they hire a mentor? Um, well, I've got a mentor myself, and uh, I'll tell you how that came about. It, it's okay. Uh, I'll I'll tell you why, and then I'll give you an application of, of my own story. Mm -hmm. Number one, first and foremost, the most important reason why you should have a mentor is they're an accountability partner, and you can bounce ideas off them. You can have a third party who use no connection to you, who isn't going to be a yes person, who will tell you as it is. That is so important, and. That's definitely number one tip, get that person involved. How, the reason why I have that person with me, um, I was going to, thinking about doing an MBA last year. Uh, I researched the cost, and at that stage, I didn't see the value in it for me, the cost benefit. Mm. So I then went to, a, he, was an, he was an acquaintance at the time, and I went, right, I want coached. And I said, James, what's your objective? And I said, I want to be a better man in 12 months. Spiritually, consciousness business, relationships, whatever other things need to be in, involved. And that's what happened because he holds me accountable to that. That's cool. So definitely get a mentor. Um, second, maybe a second bonus reason Go on, uh, uh, do, 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 is to start your studies early. Don't be crawling. Yeah. As soon as you can, get it done. Yeah. Final question then. Gaelic games or Gaelic Ooh. history? Yeah. Oh, do I have to choose? Yeah, you have to choose. Right, I'm going to be sly. I'm going to say Gaelic history because Gaelic games came from the history. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something like that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the history of Gaelic games. <laughs> it was pretty much. <laughs> well, that's basically it because it all came through. Well, whenever you consider that hurling, which is the national game of Ireland, is 2,000 years old, there's a there's a small piece of history in that. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's that's a great fact. That I love it's, it. Yeah, it's the, the oldest, the old, the fastest field game in the world, and one of the oldest games in the world. Brilliant, James. It's been amazing talking to you today. Thank you so much for joining me for for my yeah. first um, video recording as well. Absolute absolute pleasure. Uh, before we go though, most important important thing you need to answer is that if people want to find out more about you, uh, what you can provide how you can help them, which you definitely can, where should they go? Main, is, main bit is probably LinkedIn. Um, well, first one's going to be accounting exam coach, my, my website, and it's going to be released 
hopefully in the next four weeks. Okay. So there'll be accountingexamcoach.com. There will be links to that that will see social media as well. So it will be LinkedIn, um, a, a Facebook page there as well. All The LinkedIn is under my name, James Perry, but everything else is under Accounting Exam Coach. So there's Instagram as well, and there's the podcast as well. So, But primarily, give me a shout on LinkedIn. And just one final point, if uh, people look you up on Facebook, uh, you've got some amazing photos on there. My favourite, and it bizarrely came up last night while I was talking to friends and family, is uh, there's a certain house um, in the background on some kind of craggy island. Um, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, I think, for people to... Good, 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 old, good, good old father Ted. <laughs> and here's a fact, unfortunately, I was Pat Mustard, the guy who played Pat Mustard, unfortunately passed away two days ago. Pat yeah. Mustard, God bless him and his massive great, tool. Great, great actor. <laughs> great actor. Uh, but Father Ted, anybody who's never heard of Father Ted, you have to go and watch it. Because How can nobody have ever heard of Father so Ted? The thing, is, the thing is, I know people like that. You, you don't need those in your life. You don't oh, need yeah. those. So you need characters in your life. And... No, I mean, the people that don't know about it, you don't need those in your <laughs> life. <laughs> but I know, sorry, I know people like the characters in Father Ted. That's what I mean. You need those in your life. Oh, you need, oh, definitely need those. You need the entertainment in your life. Brilliant. I love it. James, once again, thank you so much. No problem, man. Really enjoyed it. I mean, where do we start with these takeaways? There's just so many. There's about 10, 20, 30 that can help you with your CIM qualifications. But I, I'm just going to pick a couple that I just want to highlight to emphasize what James and I were talking about. So the first one is in any assessment situation, it's easy to get carried away and see the question that you actually want to see. Read and reread the question before you answer it, making sure you answer the actual question and not your own. It's so easy to, to go off on a tangent and start answering your own question. Don't. Keep referring back to it. Read it and reread it. Also, check the weighting of each question. This is in terms of the actual overall marking scheme. So you can work out the word or page count per mark. Doing this will determine how much or how long you should be writing for before moving on to the next question. Remember, the first few marks are the easiest. So if you need to move on to another question and come back to this one later on, just leave a little space in your assignment paper. It's easy to forget the real world when writing an assignment, but using real world examples can really help your answer pop. It also helps with the following fundamental elements of any answer. Highlighting wider reading and research, providing justification for your answer, and finally, showing an element of understanding of your own organisation and others within the macro environment. And of course, we've got a bonus tip from James this week. Not me, but James. And that is, you can't eat an elephant in one bite. Not a true word spoken by any man, I don't think. What James means by this is that don't see your exam or assignment as one huge piece, it'll do you nothing. Break it down into manageable sections that you can control and focus on one bit at a time. Be it by task, section, question, or even breaking the question down bit by bit to make sure you cover all the necessary elements. I'm afraid I'm going to have to interject here with my own two penneth worth on this one. And what I'd suggest is you start each question by bullet pointing the key areas that you must or need to cover to gain the marks and work from there. You can elaborate on each one as you go along so they make sense and make sure you provide justification for each one. Marks on marks on marks. And that's what we're here to do. Now go off. Start your assignment and let's get that distinction. Thank you so much for joining us today on Marketing Study Lab. It really means the world that you're listening to this out there. And hopefully I've provided you some value. If you're looking to know more about what Marketing Study Lab does and is about, go to marketingstudylab.co.uk or get in touch with me personally, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or feel free to email me at peter at marketingstudylab.co.uk. 
happy marketing. Oh.